right, so we've got Mark Ormrod on uh, today. Um, no airs and graces here, mate. No intro music, nothing like that. We just get straight into it. Um, I guess there's a bit of an intro from me before I sort of let you sort of give a little bit of a heads up about yourself. Um, our paths, so you're someone I've sort of been watching from a distance for quite a while. I've seen your story. Um, I don't think, as far as I'm aware, our paths crossed career-wise. We probably have spent the same time in various different fobs around the globe um, on one or two occasions. We might unpick that and work that out a little bit later. But uh, um, again, I'm really interested in your story. I think for the people that listen to me, um, why is Mark's story relatable to you? Um, well, you'll understand why, but certainly someone I'm all about understanding what motivates people to achieve great things, what helps people mindset wise to really uh, do do better than average and do do sort of over and above um, what most people think they can do and you're certainly someone that um, I think personally um, has smashed that out of the park and is continuing to do so but uh, we'll talk about that do you mind sort of giving yourself a bit of an intro and a bit of a sort of snapshot of your life up to this point if you don't mind mate okay um you want a quick career run through type yeah, thing yeah let's go for it all right, cool. Well, I, I initially uh, went to the careers office to join the core back when I was 15 and a half. I was, I was coming up towards the end of school. Yep. I had about six months until my, I don't know what they're called now, GCSEs were on the horizon. Yep. And just had this moment of clarity. And I thought like when these exams are over, I need to either go on to college if I've done well enough or go out into the real world and get a job. And I had no idea what it was I wanted to do. So I went around and asked a lot of people, um, you know, parents, friends, family, all that kind of stuff, uh, narrowed my options down and decided that I was either going to join the fire brigade, the police or the military. Back then, I didn't really know what it was that firemen did. Uh, I thought they just would run around putting out fires. It didn't seem that glamorous. I know now they do a lot more than that. Um, it's very intense what they do. But that kind of back then for me curtailed that. I didn't, I didn't yeah. want to do that. I looked into the police, but I, I genuinely thought like most of my friends would disown me. So I didn't go down that road. And then bizarrely, because I, I was born and bred in Plymouth, right? So the core is always around me, but I didn't have a clue the Royal Marines were. Yeah. And I just thought, if you're going to be a soldier, you join the army. So yeah. I went down to the careers office, saw the army guy, got the paperwork, went home, went to get my parents to sign it because I was only 15 and a half. And then my, my dad told me I had an uncle who was a captain in the, in the Marines in a previous life. And he didn't live that far from me, about 15 miles up the road between Plymouth and I think Ashburton, a place called Buckfastly. I know it, So mate. I went up there. Say again? I know it, mate. I've spent a bit of time down in 4-2. I know Plymouth. Yeah, yeah. Me. So I went up and I saw him um, and he gave me the rundown on the core and how it was different to the army. So I went back to the careers office, saw the Royal Marine Sergeant Major down there, sat down, I watched the old recruiting VHS cassette, yeah, and nice. I was just so, from that minute on, I, I just saw guys that were jumping out of planes, using boats, they were yomping, they were in the desert, the jungle, the woodland, uh, everywhere, you know, the Arctic, and I just thought that these guys are like the ultimate, you know, all round, flexible, go anywhere, do anything kind of soldier, and if I'm going to join the military and be a soldier, yeah. that's the kind of soldier that I want to be. Yeah. So, Got the paperwork done, um, applied at 16, was accepted, did my PRMC uh, when I was 16, and then joined Limpston at 17 in February 2001. Now, I was quite lucky. I got all the way through in one hit as an original of, of 804 Troop and finished training in October later that year in 2001, about four weeks after 9-11. So we kind of knew from the off that we were going to be going somewhere yep. pretty soon. Uh, originally, I, I was trained uh, to go out to op, on Objekana in 2002 in Afghanistan, but I never went in the end. They, they scaled it back, and I think it was more your lads that went out um, than mainstream core. So, settled into unit life. Uh, 2003, rode round Optelic. So, I went out, out on Optelic 1. Fairly uneventful for me. Um, was a bit disappointed in a way it wasn't what I thought going to war was going to be like I actually found it very boring it may have just been the you know people I was deployed with we didn't get up to a lot came home 
and again settle back into unit life. Early 2005 uh, in January, my first daughter was born, and I knew that if I put my my chit in then and served up my 12 months, I would have done my minimum five years. I would have been to war. I would have earned a green beret all in that first five years. You know, that's a pretty decent resume, if you like, for those yep. first five years. So yep. that's what I did. I put my chit in and decided to leave. I think I was only going to be 21 by the time I'd left. So, you know, more than young enough to start a new career. Things, as they often do, went sideways with that relationship and, and we separated. But I continued down the path that I was on and I left and I went to South Africa and I used my education money to retrain as a bodyguard um, out in Cape Town. There's a course out there called Ronin that yes, a lot of guys go good. on. Yeah. So I went out and did that. Did very well. I came second on the course. The only guy that beat me was my roommate who was a yeah. pilot. So he was a lot cleverer than I was. And then I came home and I started, work, uh, started looking for work in the CP world. Now, I didn't really know anybody in the industry, so I struggled to get my foot in the door. Yeah. Uh, to earn some money to live on at the time, because I was actually staying at a friend's house on a sofa back then, I started working as a nightclub doorman. And it was just around about the time that they were regulating the industry, uh, trying to get rid of all the, I guess, the stereotypical thugs, you know, big, tattooed, steroid-infused animals that they had yeah. in, the, in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, and the police were coming down hard and you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a fair guy. I'm not a bully. I hate, I was bullied at school. I hate bullies, but and this sounds like an exaggeration, but I, I could literally get punched in the face in front of a policeman and I'd get arrested for hurting someone's hand. It, it was insane. Um, and things went down a less than desirable path. And, and I was looking at doing a little bit of prison time. So I panicked. And I ran back to the warm, loving embrace of the Royal Marines. Um, Feels good. Feels good. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I rejoined early in 2007. And when I did, I was given two options. Come to Limston, which I don't need to tell you is a, a non-deployable unit. Or go to 40 Commando, who were just about to start training for Operation Herrick 7. Obviously, that's what we joined the Corps for. You know, to go out and deploy and test ourselves. My life was upside down at this point, and I thought like getting away would really help. So I decided to go to 40 Commando, went out there, got involved in the OPTAG training, and then finally deployed to Afghanistan on the 7th of September. 90% of the time I was out there, we were working out of a place called uh, Ford Operating Base Robinson, down in Helmand, doing all the usual kind of stuff. Um, what all the other units and, and everyone else had done before us. And it was great. You know, things were going well. We were dominating the ground, taking the fight to the enemy, all that usual stuff. And on Christmas Eve, uh, we were given a foot patrol uh, that we were going to go out on. Very, very basic. Um, nothing at all like what we'd done up to that point. And on the way back into the FOB, uh, finishing up that foot patrol, I stood on and detonated a pressure plate IED which resulted in me losing both my legs above the knee and my right arm above the elbow, uh, making me the UK's first triple amputee from the conflict. Epic. Epic. Right. Right. Just, just uh, we'll pause there, mate, because I know there's, there's, that is a, a turning point, clearly, but, and there's loads to talk about afterwards, and, and that's, but just uh, in what you've said so far, you know, there's a lot of people that will relate to sort of lives being in chaos, you know, your words, um, and difficult or difficulties, relationships, work, and trying to balance the two um, successfully and, and unsuccessfully. And what was it about the sort of, uh, you mentioned about returning to the stability almost of the military, which some people would go, that doesn't make any sense. How is that giving you some stability? Just talk around the feelings a little bit that you may have had around that. Uh, it wasn't so much the stability. I mean, I know, you know, yeah. you know, when you're going to eat your Christmas leave, your summer leave, your Easter leave, you can kind of plan a life when you're in the military. It was more to do with a sense of identity. Yeah. You know, we, we, we chatted briefly off air about this, but I, I, I remember I was born and bred in Plymouth, right? And my, my first unit was 30 Commando, Stonehouse Barracks down in Plymouth. And I knew all the civil security guards there, you know, as a, 
young lad myself when I was running around that place as a kid. Then when I was in the core and, you know, they, we all knew each other on first name basis. And then literally the day after I left that first time, I went to go into camp to use the gym. And they're like, sorry, Mark, you can't come in. You're a civvy yeah. now. Yeah. And I was like, come on, lad, you know me. I've, yeah. You know, I've been based here for a couple of years. You know, you knew me before that. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, we know, mate, but th- you're a civvy now. And it was that black and white. Yeah. And, I was, and I just felt like crap. Yeah. And I, I eventually did get in. Um, I sorted out passes and all, and all this kind of stuff. And then I was in the gym one day. And I was doing a bit of uh, Thai boxing on one of the heavy bags. And the PTI came in and he went, oh, hello, mate. He said, you've left the corner, haven't you? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I left a couple months ago. He went, uh, excuse my language, but he went, well, get the f- my gym then. And I was waiting for him to go, way, just kidding, mate, yeah, crack yeah. on. But he didn't. And, and I just felt like crap. And I thought, yeah, is this yeah, what yeah. happens when you need the military? You just, your whole pass is just erased and you're like, there's some dirty ex boot neck and, and I hated it yeah, yeah. you know and I remember I used to get that sense of pride if you walked in the bank you know and you were speaking to the bank teller or whatever opening an account and they say what's your occupation and you grow like two feet you're like Royal Marine yeah. and then I'll go in as a civilian and I'd be like I don't really have a job at the minute I'm kind of in between jobs and I just felt worthless you know and I wanted that sense of pride back and that sense of belonging yeah you know I mean, that's I just, one of the reasons why a lot of lads personally go into security because one it you know again you went and did the course with ronin um and would have been a bodyguard ultimately yeah. you know that is a job where it's got a bit of, it's got quite a yes. lot of uh, significance to it and it sounds pretty sexy you know the reality of that job you know i'm well aware um from friends of mine that do it you know it's not as glamorous as it might seem on the face of it uh, some some jobs absolutely are more glamorous than others, but on the whole, you know, it's it's not what it turns out to be more often than not. Right. It's not something that gives people an awful lot of fulfillment because more often than not, you're working for somebody else and you're not working with a particular purpose, which I think is what, like you were explaining there with um, going back into the military, um, that gave you that sense of purpose and there was something, you know, that you were working towards. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, and it's also fair to say that in my first five years, I got in a lot of trouble. You know, I was just a young Marine having fun. I think I got charged three times. Um, you know, just 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 a young guy having fun. But when I went back in, I had sat down and meticulously planned out my career, written it down. Um, as soon as I got back from Afghan, I was going to start taking the steps necessary to do what it was I wanted to do and then spend the remainder of my career positively building something rather than just floating around waiting for the next deployment or the next exercise or whatever it may be. So I had a bit of a plan the second time around. That's, that's good. That's good. So let's fast forward again um, back to that incident in 2007. Now, I, completely ironically, I didn't know this at all. Christmas Eve 2007 was one of the, as an event for me, similar circumstances really, that just, that night was massively significant for me in my career. And uh, to hear, I didn't know that it was, it was uh, Christmas Eve 2007 that, uh, you know, you trod on the ID. So just, just talk to us about what you knew about the event um, and then your sort of memory or whatever you've got memory-wise of it. I, I remember all of it. Um, so like I said, we were, we were just about to give Overwatch to another section, actually, um, so they could peel back into the fob and then you know, they'd return the favor and we'd all go back in and be safe. So I was getting into a fire position. Uh, I was second in command of the section. Everyone else was, was set. I was just about to take my position. And then I, as I was getting down onto my belly, I, I knelt on this pressure plate and set this device off. Now, initially, um, there, there was no pain. There, I couldn't see anything for a good couple of seconds because of the dust and the sand. It created like this cloud. It blinded me. And my gut instinct because there was no pain just a huge adrenaline rush and i could just hear all the chaos i assumed that we had been attacked and i remember that where i was facing behind me because we were on some high ground down beneath us um all that was down there was flat mud fields except for one rectangular forestry block so in all that chaos and confusion i thought if someone's gonna 
you know, RPG us or mortar us. They're going to do it from behind cover in that block. So as soon as this dust cloud settles and I can see what's going on and assess the situation, I'll turn around, I'll start laying down fire on this position and hopefully all the other guys will and we can peel back and we get out of there safely. Now, after about four or five times, this is all going on in my head. I'm saying, turn around, Mark, turn around, turn around. I did the enemy, you know, get out of there. Probably the fourth time I said it in my head, I, I realized that where my body should have been moving, it wasn't. And it, it was a bizarre feeling, but I, I couldn't figure out why. And I couldn't see anything, so I couldn't make sense of it. So I just waited. And eventually this, this dust cloud, you know, it got to about my chest height. And I looked around frantically, just hoping that the rest of my section were okay. Yeah. I think they had been blasted out of the area by the, uh, by the IED. And then this dust cloud eventually settled and hit the ground. And then I looked down to, you know, where my legs should have been. And they were both just completely torn off from the knee down. Um, Incredible. Which I'm sure you've been in a lot of traumatic situations yourself. It's very surreal, isn't it? Yeah, completely, know? completely. You can't train for that, even though they do an incredible job of trying to simulate that. Again, I don't know during your uh, pre-deployment training, the, the sort of uh, training that you did, but you know, we used to build that into our training uh, with, with um, getting amputees down to sort of act as battle casualties and all sorts of things. It still doesn't prepare you for when it, it's one of your friends. Um, yeah. But just what, so what was... What was your first thought when you, when you looked down and saw your legs or didn't see your legs? It, it just, I wasn't in any pain, which is the bizarre thing. Mm. And it just, the whole thing felt like a dream. And I was just lying there, you know, sat on my bum, looking down, thinking, confused, I think. Like, I don't know what I'm looking at. This doesn't make sense to me. You know, where are my legs? It, even though, you know, you kind of know what's going on, you don't. And then probably two seconds into it I remembered about my team again and just I guess to distract myself from what I was looking at I started looking around trying to see if I could see anyone else and I saw the section commander uh, Corporal Halesby and he's a guy that I came through Limpston with in 2001 same troop and his face you know he was drained of colour his eyes were clearly in shock which kind of said to me in all that chaos and confusion you know this is happening, Mark, you need to do something about it. So I went to look back at my legs to kind of give myself that, I guess, final confirmatory signal and then, you know, accept what happened and figure out how I was going to save myself because, yeah. you know, the lads were, uh, are not allowed to come running in to help me. And as I started scanning the ground, I got to about the three o'clock position and then I saw my hand, my, my arm lying there on the ground, you know, just, it was still attached to my body but it was completely ripped open from my bicep down to my wrist. Uh, the bone was missing, completely shattered. It, it just looked like a dog had been chewing all over, you know, on the end of my arm. It was a, just a mess. Unbelievable. And, um, you know, that's when I realised, you know, this is happening. You need to do something about it. But there, there wasn't a lot I could do because I knew that everyone else in my section was trained not to run in to help me because of the risk of setting off other devices. So I took my helmet off. Uh, and I threw it and this we were in like the shallow bow that's yeah. what we were taking cover in because there was no other form of cover up there and uh, the American SF lads that we were working with they re did a report afterwards they cleared the area there were six of these devices around but this hole was 12 feet deep by 15 feet around so I knew that evacuating me was going to be ninja so I just lay there and wait to die uh, in no pain very relaxed almost with the sun beating down on my face i just pretended i was on a beach in spain uh you know just relaxing there just about to drift off and i imagined that i would start to gradually black out like you would when you go to sleep you know drift off but this time i just wouldn't wake up now as i was doing that everyone's around me you know they're like trying to keep you conscious you got the guy marking the safe route one guy in the comms i hear this engine like a diesel engine screaming in the distance and I know that from where we were to where the fob was to where the HQ compound was it was likely that was the medic being scrambled out the HQ compound to come and get me so I just listened as it as it went through the fob I heard it stop at the front gate as they moved the gate I heard it go down the hill across the main road and then it stopped at the bottom and I heard the medic scrambling up this cliff face to come and get me he jumped straight into the crater um obviously the, the safe path had already been marked and then 
gave me some morphine um, to try and take the edge off because it, it was now starting to, to creep in a little bit, the pain. Just on that, then, one, sorry to interrupt. You say um, it just started to creep in a bit. So how, how long do you think, I mean, I'm sure people have filled in the, any sort of, you know, because sometimes when trauma hap- like, and chaos happens like this, time becomes really weird, doesn't it? We've got a really yeah. nice relationship with time. But do you know how long you'd passed by that point? And then, you know, on, for people to listen and to try and relate it on a scale of one to 10 almost, what sort of pain level would you have said you, you was in at that point? I wouldn't have said I was in any pain. It was like extreme discomfort. It was almost like in both my legs and my arm, if you had pins and needles, but times a thousand, it was just a throbbing, uncomfortable, horrible, irritating feeling, not a painful one. Yeah. Um, and I, I think I was probably only there for about 10 minutes, at the most 15. Um, yeah. But obviously in that situation, it feels a hell of a lot longer. I can't, I can't even begin to imagine, to be honest. And, and were you losing a lot of blood visually? Did it look yeah. like you were losing? Because I, I take it it was dusty and sandy, so it would have been getting absorbed yeah. by the ground, a lot of it. But um, were you conscious of that? Yeah, uh, uh, it was just falling out. And I, I didn't have a clue back then how many pints or litres of blood that your bodily actually held, but there was a fair amount coming out. And I could feel myself fading, you know. Again, not it wasn't scary. I wasn't worried. I, I think I had this extreme confidence in the lads in my section. Yeah. And in the back of my mind, I always knew I was going to be all right. I just knew it. I, I knew how good they were mm-hmm. and how many times we'd ran these drills over that they were just going to, I was going to be fine. It's interesting you say that because uh, one of the things that I do now is going, as I'm sure you do, um, help teams, high-performing teams, whether that's in sport or corporate, understand trust and understand relationships from, from my point of view. Um, and it's the same as your point of view. It's the same as their point of view. But we have a different context in, in just how much trust and just how strong those relationships and bonds are that you, like you just explained there, you could put your life in their hands. And uh, you did do, and, yeah. and you had confidence in that. And that's where football teams, rugby teams, sports teams certainly would struggle to relate to. But again, you you, okay. like you had absolute trust. 100%. And it just, I think that's why I didn't panic. You know, and when you think the guy who was closest to me, who was clearing the safe route yeah. to get to me, well, I think he was 19 years old at the time. And that didn't bother me at all because I knew he was a professional and that he'd do his job no matter what the circumstances. So this medic gets to me, gives me the morphine, starts putting the tourniquets on my legs. He asked me to help with the one on the arm just to keep me conscious, I guess, and give me something to do. And then when he deemed me, you know, safe and stable enough to try and evacuate me, he put his hands under my armpits and he dragged me onto like this... uh, so it wasn't, I don't think it was like a stereotypical rigid stretcher. I think it was like a big tablecloth with handles on it. Yeah. But as he pulled me, that I felt a horrible shooting pain in my right leg. And it, it almost felt like what I imagine it would be like putting a screwdriver on your kneecap and just jacking it down. Nice. Um, That's image. Yeah. Right. So I, I asked him to, to put me down and I looked down. To where the pain was coming from and there was like a, a thin piece of rope it looked like coming out of my leg covered in blood and claret and sand and dust so I followed it on the ground and it went into my boot and so we picked my boot up which still had my foot in it and had to cradle it on my stomach because it was still attached by like, I guess it was a nerve or a tendon so we had to put it on my stomach to evacuate me took me off this high feature put me in the back of the vehicle that was waiting and then on the way back into the fog, we had to go up a hill. And as we did, obviously not being a, a smooth tarmac surface, like a big pothole-ridden, sandy dune type thing, um, the guy driving had to be quite aggressive. And at one point, the, the medic fell out the back. And Come then I went out me. after him. And the guy driving, who happened to be my sergeant major, swung around, put his arm out to grab me, to hold me in and ended up grabbing the femur bone coming out my right leg to hold me in. He, he left the medic. I mean, he must have had a lot of decisions to make. 
He left the medic because the other section we'd left with her during the day, who we were given overwatch for, were at the bottom of the hill, so he was safe. Yeah. And he flew me back, uh, he drove me back into the FOB to the HLS. And the last thing I can remember is the Chinook landing and the the sandstorm that it creates, you know, and the heat from the from the exhaust. Then I blacked out, which is when I, I later found out that I was when I was class is currently dead yeah um incredible incredible yeah. mate just again you you mentioned quite i mean you've told this story i'm sure a lot of times now so it's almost probably become normal for you to talk about the story but just that the shooting pain under your knee and then putting the the your your foot connected by what i'm assuming is nerve and some some tendon perhaps um onto your chest i mean what was going through your head genuinely at that point anything it just just it's just chaotic and confusing you, and you just but you look at it it's almost like matter of fact and it's like that's a problem deal with it dealt with that on to the next thing and it, it's so bizarre when you when you think about what you're going through and the way you kind of just process it it was almost like a checklist how my leg hurts what's wrong with it that's the problem problem solved and we're going up the hill He's falling out. That's not my problem. I'm falling out. That is my problem. He's got my leg. Happy days. Problem solved. Yeah. Get to the HLS. You know, it's just like boom, boom, boom. And the way that you are quite processed in that thinking, see, it, again, it's, this makes absolute sense to you um, because it's just how it is. That's how you had to deal with it. But I'm convinced, and again, there's no research out there to deny or uh, prove this, unfortunately. It's just through my discussions that these people that are very processed, logical thinkers even in chaos you know there's decisions to make and if you can make those decisions um and be you know a relative as sure as you can be in that situation that that's the, that just needs to happen do it then that's the only way to get through these situations and um, the only way to sort of survive if you like is to take action and then work out if that was the right move if not get the new information re you know readdress the problem and, and go again Procrastination, mm -hmm. lack of decision making in chaos doesn't work. And no good. Um, you know, we talk about having a very hierarchical structure. When chaos is happening, it's flat. And whoever's got the best idea, that is a valid solution. And we go with that. And mm -hmm. you, it, you have to coach that into teams. You have to coach that into organizations because people are very hierarchical. And especially the military where you've got, you've described it, he was your sergeant major. And so naturally you would think you would align to that decision and go, well, but he's never experienced that kind of situation before. Right. You just need the best solution. And when your, you, your reaction to what he was doing was probably giving him all the information he needed, whatever you were doing, you know, have, you were, he was content that you were with him on the plan and you were going and that's just what you had to do, right? Um, it is an incredible story. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, I take it there was a, you, you, you died on the clinic, clinically. I did, so there, there was another, one of the other guys in the section was injured and he got shrapnel wounds in his back. So, um, you know, they, they prioritise casualties in that way. Yep. So they basically, they felt me for a pulse. I didn't have one. They couldn't get any intravenous lines into me because all my veins had collapsed. And when they put an oxygen mask on me, it didn't steam up to show that I was breathing. So they just threw me in a corner and left me because I, according to their vital signs, I was dead. So they got to work on the other guy. As a medic walked past me to get some equipment to go back and work on Stu, the other guy, he, he said that my eyes started to flutter, which meant that my heart was still beating. So we alerted some of the other medics. They all came over and got to work on me. And three days before this incident, the, the top brass in the army medical field had cleared for use a new technique where if you can't get intravenous lines into somebody's veins for whatever reason you can drill into their tibia or their fibia okay problem being my tibia and fibia have been blasted off by the ied so these guys who i imagine had practiced in a nice clean semi-calm sterile hospital room to do these procedures are now in the back of a chin up banking left to right with sand and dust everywhere with one guy who's dead, one guy who's dying, they can't do this procedure that they've been trained to do because he hasn't got a tib or a fib. So they make this snap decision in the heat of the moment to drill into my hip from the front and the back. 
And so two of the medics, Millsy and Charlie, took some medical drills. One went in through the front, one went in through the back. They put an intravenous sign into me. They said they didn't even know if it was going to bite, if it was going to take and, and get the fluids in. Somehow it did. And they said within about three minutes, I was awake and responsive and back in the land of the living. Incredible, so, mate. It's absolutely, yeah. it's absolutely incredible. Um, you know, things like this shape how people do things, medical practices even, uh, going forward. <laughs> this has happened through all of history, right? Um, second, or except was a classic example where just new things were being learned on the battlefield um, mm. and used in... Because normal hospitals back in the UK just aren't getting this level of trauma to right. work on or experiment on. And these, these, are, these are the sort of uh, places where these things are practiced for the first time or even found, um, which is incredible. I think, you know, probably people like yourself, um, we changed our standard operating procedures with where we carried tourniquets because we used to carry one on our arms. And sometimes that was no use because, you know, your arm would be no more. And we, so we yeah. carried them elsewhere. I don't want to go into tactical detail, but you know, it's like things like that, that um, shape how things are done going forward. So yeah, incredible stuff. So talk a bit about your, I mean, I take it you got flown back to, uh, is it Selly Oak or? Selly Oak Hospital. Yeah, yeah, Birmingham, for those that don't know. And were you conscious of any of that journey, some of it, you know, that, that process or not? No, I mean, literally the last thing I remember is that helo landing. And then waking up briefly on the 28th of December, I arrived in Selly Oak about four o'clock in the morning on Christmas Day. And I was in a coma until the 28th. And it's just like a scene out of a movie, you know, where you see someone on the, the hospital bed and all they see is the, the blurry lights of the ceiling and all the chaos around them. I could just, I remember it being really difficult to open my eyes. It felt like someone had put hooks in my eyelids and put lead weights on them. And I was lying there and I could hear all these people around me talking Yeah. and everything was echoing. I yeah. think it was because of the drugs and medication. And I was trying to open my eyes and I was focusing all my energy to my eyelids and I couldn't open them. I, I guess it was a you know, part of being so weak and, and the drugs and everything. But I woke up for about 15 seconds uh, on the 28th and was just exhausted and just fell back to sleep again until the next day. Um, but that's when they, they must have reduced the medication and brought me out of that. And then I started the recovery process pretty much four days after, four or five days after. Yeah, incredible. And so what, what's, I take it, I mean, you, you mentioned the other day on the phone to me that you, you had some microsurgery. I mean, <clears throat> talking 12 years later now, almost 12 years to the day. So the, the problem I had, once I was awake and I was at that home, I did a week in intensive care and then went upstairs to... I had a, a single man room on the bones and plastics ward. And that's where I started um, my physio. You know, I went, yeah. uh, you can probably see the big scar on my hand. Can see that, yep. That's a shrapnel wound. So I only had these two fingers and a bit of my thumb to use initially to pull myself out of bed and stuff. So we started getting to work straight away on, you know, figuring out how my body worked now. Because I'd sit up in bed and without legs to anchor me, I'd just roll back like a weeble. Um, you know, figuring out how to get out into a wheelchair and do all this stuff to transfer onto a toilet. I just wanted to start as early as I possibly could. And um, it was about three and a half weeks into it, actually. Um, I'm doing all right. My morale's creeping up. I'm making progress in this very, very basic light physio that I'm doing. Yeah. And a guy knocks on my door and he walks in and introduces himself to me. I, I can't remember his name, but he was the, the UK's leading professional in the field of amputations so this is i think late january uh, 2008 he had been amputating people for over 33 years at that point right. and he just came in my room and he said you know non-emotionally you're never going to walk again because in my experience and i've met hundreds and thousands of amputees and i've never met one of them who's just got one leg missing above the knee that has any success using prosthetics and that, that was the key being above the knee and he said, it's so painful. They take so much energy to use and they're so difficult to use that most people just don't bother and they get in a wheelchair. So, you know, good luck with the rest of your life. And then turned around and walked out. That was, there was only two times in my whole rehab when, you know, I went to a dark place. That was the first time when he told me that. 
I mean, again, just on that, I mean, how, how powerful a message and actually unhelpful. Obviously, we know going forward now that he was completely wrong. But again, you, you almost a pioneer in the treatment and the success uh, with, with what, what happened. And this is why I find it so fascinating, because, again, I want to, I want to try and unpick. Well, one, talk to us about that dark place, because there's lots of people that can relate to a really dark place and sort of life challenging dark places, shall we say, um, I'm sure. I know a lot of people that have been there. And then what was their sort of internal intrinsic motivator to pull you out of that? Well, initially, when he told me that, uh, for about four or five days, you know, I just turned my phone off. You know, I was really angry. I turned away visitors. And it's actually a regret of mine because one of the lads on tour with me, uh, Corporal Damien Overhill, uh, another Janner, yeah. He came home, he left me an answerful message saying, listen, mate, I want to come and visit you. I've got two weeks r and R. I I never bothered calling him back. And then he went back to Afghan in February and was, was blown up and killed, yep. you know? So I, I, I regret never calling him back, but I just wasn't in the headspace to, to want to speak to anybody. I think I would have just burst out crying if I spoke to him. Yeah. But about a week and a half, not even that long, actually, after that doctor walked in my room, I get another knock on my door. And it, it, you know, it was one of those big, like oak doors with a glass rectangular panel, so you can see people's faces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I, I, get, I don't recognise this guy knocking on my door, but I'm starting to feel a little bit better now after five or six mm -hmm. days. So I invite him in, and this guy walks in my room wearing two prosthetic legs, and he sat down and he, he introduced himself. His name was Mick Brennan, and in 2005. Mick was serving with the British Army in Iraq and he had the back door of, a, I think it was a BV-206 uh, open. So he, the top half of his body was protected, the bottom half wasn't. Suicide bomber detonated, took off both his legs above the knee. And then he sat in my room and talked to me about his journey. And he told me his highs, his lows, you know, what was difficult, what wasn't. He told me what he was doing now. You know, at that point in his life, I think he was a he was on the Paralympic Development Squad. He was still in the army. He was a father. You know, told me all these things, and and gave me hope. Yeah. And I've always, yeah. I've always believed, from a young age, we're all pretty much, if we're all born healthy without any major disabilities or anything like that, then I believe, we are all we can all kind of achieve the same things if we adopt the same physical attributes and mental attributes. Yeah. And when I saw this guy, and I thought, okay. I've got the arm missing. That's a little bit more tricky, but effectively I can walk again because he's done it. Now all I've got to do is copy what he did mentally and physically. And I should be able to get to this a, a level close to what he's at. So I got my, I got a laptop and I started doing all this research about amputees and prosthetics and everything. And I came across a guy in America who was a triple amputee as well, who had been hit by a train in 2002 and he was 15. Wow. And this guy was on another level. You know, he was a full-time prosthetic user. He didn't use a wheelchair. He didn't have carers. He didn't travel with people. He didn't have any special adaptive equipment in his cars. He had none of that stuff. He was just living the way he had before. And so between the two of them, what I'd seen, I knew what was achievable. And so when I left hospital after six weeks, I went to Headley Court. I had to be a little bit patient because I had a lot of open wounds on my legs, which meant I couldn't jump straight into prosthetics because they weren't healed yet. Um, but I carried on with my physio eventually got issued with the prosthetic legs and then started the process of of learning to walk again and it was a lot harder than i thought it was going to be yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot harder I, I think i was quite arrogant about it to be fair yeah which which probably protected you because some people may have not have even bothered starting if and this is what they st first doctor that was probably the message that most people realize just how hard it is and just cannot find the motivation to just keep working at it i can only begin to imagine it's interesting what you say around um so what was the the triple amputee's name that you spoke about the american Cameron. 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 So again we talk about and again one of the things that i do and i know you do now sort of uh, mentorship mentoring and, and coaching um, having that strong role model can be a real force multiplier multiplier for per, for people to you know because we've all got our, our own self-image right um and your ideal self might be right up there um but your self-image can be there and there's a number of ways that you can raise 
your own self image and lower this ideal self to make, because that gap in between the two is stress and it causes people uh, lack of enthusiasm, lack of motivation to try and achieve this ideal self. But when you've got a really good role model, and I'm sure this is where people hear your story and can go, wow, you know, I can, if, if, if you've overcome that kind of adversity, then I can achieve what I'm struggling with right now. Just to listen, because this is how we communicate, and this is why I love doing what I do now. Um, part of it, because you're learning by other people's stories, and we, we communicate best through stories. But these are often stories that aren't really told or spoken about because they're they're difficult, and people people want to hear about um, other people's success that have you know amazing success, maybe financial or whatever, and that's what people can be attracted by. But this sort of you know, like you said, we're all wired the same um mentally and physically and if one person i'm the same i had people before me that all the things that you know again i say quite humbly that i've achieved by comparison to yourself but the things that i've achieved i was never i don't think the first person to do those things i always saw other people do them and went you know what i think i can do that mm -hmm. and uh so that i can relate to that story having that really strong role model i still use a, a business mentor now because you know i Crikey, I don't know everything. You know I, know, I know you would be humble enough to say the same. We're always learning. And to, to, to re help other people up, you've got to be getting pulled up as well, right? You've got to be filling up the, like, like a watering can. If you're giving out all this, this uh, experience and knowledge and mentoring, mentorship, et cetera, then you've got to be getting filled up as well, right? And it's, it's having those strong role models. And so it's, it's, it's massively relatable for me. Um, but yeah, so going on a little bit then, your sort of journey and sort of where it, where it took you and sort of let's talk about the kind of because this is going in a good direction really and, and it just goes from strength to strength in my opinion so I'm going to sort of uh, share a little bit of that so after um, the, so the problem I had in rehab was because I was the first triple amputee from Afghan and I, and I think since the first world war um, although although Mick the double amputee that visited me had, had been through the system before I had the extra challenges of, of having my dominant arm missing. Yeah. So it was, you know, there, there was nothing was easy. It was all a struggle because I had to be the first person to try this and fail at this and then try again and fail again until I succeeded and keep doing all this. And it, it was hard, which is why I took so much inspiration from Cameron. So initially, all I did was watch his videos. I'd watch his YouTube videos and where I'd struggle to maybe walk down some stairs because everyone was saying, well, you've got no knees. Above knee amputees can't use stairs. And I'd take a video and go, well, hold on. This yeah. guy's got no knees and he's walking down the stairs. Yeah. But no one knew how to do any of that stuff. So I reached out to Cameron and his team and I asked them for some mentorship and some help, which they very kindly gave me. And on the 9th of June, 2009, I went out to meet them. And I underwent a three-week intensive boot camp Wow. where they just literally whipped my ass every single day. You know, I'd get up in the morning and my back would be in pieces, my groin would be cut, I'd have blisters on my legs, and they, they wouldn't let me take my wheelchair with me, and they wouldn't let me take a carer. Yeah. Um, so I had no choice, but every day I had to put my legs on. I had to get up, I had to grizz it out, go through the pain, and just keep walking to build up my resistance and my tolerance. And, uh, that's, and that's mental and physical. Because there were times, and one of the guys I was staying with, one of the prosthetists, even said he, at some points he could sense my anger towards him so much that he had a nightmare. I creeped in his room one day and stabbed him in the middle of the night because they were pushing me so hard. But I, I wanted to be polite and not lose my temper, but inside they could sense it, you know, because I was just in pain all the time. But I knew that that was short-term pain for long-term gain. And just like coming through Limpston and, and, and what you did, if, if you just push through it all, you know, it's worth it at the end. And, that's, and you can look back on that for the rest of your life. That's, you know? for, me, for me, that's that's resilience in a nutshell, isn't it? And people, um, there's a big industry around resilience right now because people struggle to real grasp um, the concept of it. But that, um, we talk about being outside your comfort zone and your comfort zone, again, I'm, you know, I can I can hardly relate to it if I'm perfectly honest. I don't feel like I can, but because of the the pain and the suffering that you must have had to have gone through to achieve what it was. But what I do relate to is this 
this comfort zone that everybody lives in. Everybody knows nowadays that you need to be able to live in this stretch zone and it's uncomfortable when you're there. But people really don't like to live there. And they, they know that's the route to success, but just getting in there every single day, day in, day out, because that is the only route to There's no magic hack. You know, your circumstances, there's, there's nothing you're going to be able to do that's going to create a, a life-changing event where all of a sudden you're going to be fine again. You've got a journey ahead of you. Um, I was chatting to Dean Stott a few months ago or a few weeks ago, um, and he talked about this 14,000 mile bike ride he did. And it's from where you are today <laughs> to Australia on a bike plus another 4,000 miles. And that journey is almost, it's, it's overwhelming. You can't almost comprehend it. Um, and again, it's, it was for a personal challenge, but so again, nothing on your level, but if you just look at the problem, it's just overwhelming. And that there is where that becomes uncomfortable and people don't like to sit in that area there because it's overwhelming. But I'm, I'm imagining you came up with certain strategies, which I'd like, to, if you don't mind sort of share, you don't know if maybe you did know, or you do know what they are, maybe you don't, but did you come up with certain strategies to just keep you going day after day? It, it was to just break it down to take one day at a time. I know it sounds cliche, no. but again, if, if I looked at that three weeks in, in a one hour, it would have been too overwhelming because I would have got to like day two and been like, oh my God, I've got nearly three weeks still left and you know, I wouldn't have been able to hack it. So I literally would just get up every morning and go, okay, let's do another day. All right, let's do it. And then every day it got a little bit easier. You know, the pain subsided, my legs, my stumps toughened up. I was learning the techniques and, and getting better at them for you know walking around day by day or doing more stuff to the point where it became quite enjoyable you know because I was I was really I was getting up and really proud that what three days ago was impossible to me now wasn't too bad at all and I just you just got to break it down into whatever manageable chunks are right for you and then just attack it you know it, you know, you, you described it, I, uh, I know it sounds cliche, but this is the route to success. And this is the things yeah. that people have to do. And you can look around apart from this over. So I talk about the obstacle is the way. People have got this obstacle in front of them. Um, they know what they when, when people come to me as a, as a uh, wanting a, a coach or a mentor, they're coming to me because they know they've got a problem. They've got an issue, whatever that is, whether it's just unfulfilled in their careers, whether it's a, a certain challenge that they just don't feel ready for, whatever. They know what the problem is. Um, and we just, we just talk around and we talk about um, the obstacle being the way. And so rather than looking for this solution around it, actually, let's break down the problem. Uh, is it as big as you think it is? Normally not. Um, if it is, what are the bite-sized chunks that we can take out of it each day and create a journey where it's way more manageable? And uh, it does sound cliche, but as far as I'm aware, I don't know anybody, whether it's Usain Bolt, whether it's um, Warren Buffett, you know, that they all yeah. talk about this consistency of effort. Uh, Messi, yeah. like quite famously, you know, arguably one of the best footballers ever, uh, talks about, yeah, it was... He was 18 years to, to be in an overnight success, 18 years of hard work to become this overnight success that everybody talks about. You know, yeah. he just grafted every single day and there's turns out there's no shortcut, right? That in my yeah. world, that Duratus, that's, you know, my sort of company is about the hardening of the mind, the hardening of the body. And that's, that's the only way to success that practice daily effort and grind. Um, but people don't like it and it's uncomfortable, right? Relatable. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I tell people, like, even if whatever it is you're going through, you just improve by 1% every day. Mm. You know, when, when I was first learning to walk again, I had the mindset of if I just take one step more, just one step today, at least I've moved forward, you know, and that will mentally put me in the right place for the following day. Yeah. You know, and again, if I'm having a rubbish day, all I've got to do is push myself to make one more step than I did the day before, and I'm still moving forward. You know, and that's progress and that's growth. And, and that's what, that's where the motivation comes from. Yeah, massive. Mm -hmm. mate. And so some people will be aware, some people won't. I mean, if you don't mind just talking about where your career has gone now. I mean, okay, so you learn, again, I don't want to sort of shorten that journey because I'm sure it's been an incredible graft and grind, but you learn to walk again. Um, you know, you sat in your car, you learn to drive again. I, I'm sure you know, those people listening that's struggling to pass their driving test, you know, you know, uh, 
and, and there you are sort of having to completely relearn these skills um, through, you know, just so much more disadvantaged in, in some way. Uh, but I know mentally stronger than most people because you've gone through this journey and you be, a challenge is always, you don't see things as a threat now, am I right? You see things as a challenge. And, uh, yeah. uh, and, and that is what helps people to really sort of uh, uh, break it down. So talk about where, you know, I know some of the things that you've done, but just where you've taken um, this, this second chapter, if you like. So I, I was actually really lucky. I think because I, I was hit on Christmas Eve 2007. Um, and I think Mick, who visited me, and his friend were the only other two amputees from the Iraq-Afghan era yeah. um, that were before me. So I was the only one in the corps at the time, I think, um, from combat. And it wasn't until after I was injured that, that a load of guys started coming through the system. So when I was looking at, at discharge, I went through all these programs that they had, which I don't think were at all designed for people being mentally discharged, like, you know, the resettlement stuff. Yep. And I had, I had one 45 minute interview on the phone and was told that I should be a bricklayer. And my second 45 minute interview on the phone said that I should be a checkout assistant at Sainsbury's in Plymouth. And I, and I just remember thinking, I'm sure even in this state, I can add more value to the world. And not there's anything wrong with those jobs at all, but they're just not me. And I'm sure I've been through what I've been through and, and the short previous career I had, I could offer more to the world yep. than just that. Now, I was very lucky. I was just about to set out in September 2010 on a, on a three and a half thousand mile run from New York to LA, a uh, fundraiser. And I got a phone yeah. call off a retired... Royal Marines Brigadier called Charlie Hobson uh, and he called me up and introduced himself and he said I work I'm the chief executive of the Royal Marines Association would you like a job and I was like sir I would love a job what are you going to do he said I have no idea we'll figure it out go, on, go off on your run and come back and we'll sort it out so um, that's what I did I went off on the run came back and Richie Puck who we were talking about at the time was the welfare and operations manager at the association so I became the welfare and operations assistant for the Royal Marines Association in 2010. Um, and I've been working with the, the association and the charity ever since. You know, there's, there's been a lot of changes happening recently. The, the association, the charity in April this year merged to become one. So my job changed now to marketing and communications, but I'm still in that area, in that arena. Um, I, the, the bizarre thing was, um, what we talked about earlier that first time I left and I felt horrible and like I was worthless I've been out the core now for nine years but I don't feel like I'm out yeah. I feel more like I'm still in and I've been promoted yeah you know I went from Marine Ormrod one day to Mr Ormrod but in an office surrounded by all the other injured lads who were coming to me asking for help almost like I was their troop sergeant at this point yeah. And it felt good, you know, yeah. and, I, and I was really, really lucky. Um, but so many things have come off the back of that, you know. So like a lot of guys in my situation now, we're all on the speaking circuit. So we get to travel around the world, uh, sharing our story with anything from, you know, a school in Singapore to a billion pound corporate in London, um, you know, just trying to help their employees and, and school kids. And, and, this, and this is because there's so much to be learned, I feel. And, you know, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of things that give us fulfillment in this world. It might be, for some people, it might be finances. For some people, it might be um, significance or fame. Um, but then contribution and giving back yep. is one of those things that really can motivate people. When you feel like you're doing something for a purpose greater than yourself um, and you're helping, like you say, you know, are you more fulfilled speaking to a multi-billion pound corporate or are you more fulfilled giving information to children where they learn a little bit about life and go, do you know what? I can, I could do this or I can overcome these problems that I'm facing. Yeah. It's bizarre because the speaking world and, and I still struggle now to, to comprehend it, but the, it's very lucrative. Like you can earn a lot of money doing it from from the background that, that we come from, you know, I used to earn about £1,100 a month. In the schools, you get nothing. But it's so much more fulfilling when this brown envelope turns up at your house 
with 35 letters in, handwritten by the kids, saying what they loved about your talk and drawing pictures of you with a hook for a hand and funny prosthetic leg. It's so much more. I've got a box in my house just filled with all these trinkets and gizzets that school kids have sent to me over the years yeah. as a thank you for coming in and spending half an hour to an hour with them, yeah. just telling my story and having a good time. Yeah. You know, it's brilliant. Yeah, no, that's amazing. It's amazing, mate. And uh, talk to us quickly about uh, Invictus Games because I know you've had, some might say, a fair amount of success. Uh, again, from not being able to walk, being UK's first military triple amputee, um, to now, to now, what Inv Invictus Games, etc., going forward. Yeah, the the whole sport thing was a bit of a weird one because a lot of guys when they got injured uh, initially jumped into sport, and I hated it. Absolutely hated it. Everyone would always come up to me and go, so when are you going to do the Paralympics then, Mark? Yeah. And I'm like, I'm, I've got no interest in the Paralympics. Why would you ask me that? But they just assume because you've lost a couple of digits that you're going to go into sport. But my focus back in the day was learning to walk without using my wheelchair to ditch my wheelchair. Yeah. So I missed that whole boat. But in 2016, I was setting my goals for the following year. And I thought, well, it'd be really nice as at the 10 year point 2017 at Christmas Eve to have done something that I've not done before yep. so I sat down and I was in my office at home and I was sat on my chair and I closed my eyes and I imagined like a jigsaw puzzle and you know it had family in there and I'd set goals around that before it had my career, my health and fitness my personal development and it was like the centerpiece was missing so I sat there with my eyes closed for about 5 minutes trying to think what was missed and what haven't I done in 10 years, what I could do this year to celebrate 10 years of life. And it was sport. You know, I'd never done any sport before. No, I'd heard of the Invictus Games. I think yep. they had ran two games at that point. And I'd seen my friends uh, go out there, compete, win medals, you know, really advance in their rehab and everything like that. And I thought, okay, I'll give that a shot, this Invictus Games thing. Yep. Not really knowing anything about it. So I looked into it. And I didn't like any of the sports that they had on offer. So before I was injured, I used to fight Thai boxing, full contact kickboxing, and I boxed a heavyweight for the core. None of this adaptive sport interested me. So I looked on, on the, the website and I picked the sports, which I thought would just be all about brute force and ignorance. So rowing, hand cycling, and swimming. I thought it's just fizz. I'll go there as a former Marine, and I'll just trash everybody because I'm fit and I'm stupid and I won't stop until I win. And um, I applied. I went to the first training camp, sat on a rowing machine. I went full tilt for four minutes and I almost went blind. Like, <laughs> I, was, I was so exhausted at the end. I got tunnel there. vision. I was just about to pass out. Yeah. And I got off that rowing machine and I'm like, what the hell was that? Yeah. I thought this was going to be easy and I was blowing. Yeah. And um, I decided then that I need to take it a lot more seriously. And so I was fortunate enough in, in 2017 um, to be selected for the team out in Canada. And then 2018, I made the team again in Australia. And I think the first year I did two rowing events, two hand cycling events, two swimming events. And then the year after that, two rowing, three swimming uh, and chop and discuss, and I came away with, in total of two years, four gold medals, four bronze, three silver, and they have a, an award for every country that attends and every athlete that attends. They have one award for the best country and one award for the best athlete. Yes. And I got best athlete in the first year in Canada. Um, I, I'm not sure why, but I, I, I did, and I'm. You know, it just it was the it was the icing on the cake for me getting that. Well, I think I think um, I think people listening understand why. Um, and again, you're probably too humble to say it. It's just an, it's it is an incredible story how you know this this journey. And we're talking talking a journey of could do some quick math. We're talking just over ten years from the injury to this. And a gold medal is a gold medal. What's it really worth? It's not really worth anything. It's the story that, that that's attached to that. I'm sure you see that and would, would sort of agree. And, and for you personally, um, it's, a, it's something to recognize this journey that you've been through, which mm -hmm. um, is just mind-blowing, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, what, in your opinion, so why, 
why would why is it that people fail so often or why, why don't people have the same level of success that you can quantify do you think what's the difference um i don't know i mean i'm sure some people would disagree but i think that where the day and age we live in now everything's too easy you know, we're talking on these phones. I could pick this phone up now and answer any question that I have in my mind just by going on to Google. Yep. Um, I don't know. You were talking about earlier about going outside your comfort zone. I think a lot of people would just live within it, you know, too much. And they're happy to coast along and, and do whatever makes them happy and not really want to push themselves and challenge themselves. But, you know, when I came through training here to be a Royal Marine at 17 and I achieved at 18, it, it changed my world because I knew that what I was capable of achieving, if I put my mind to it yep. and just obsessed about it, yep. you know, just got obsessed. And that was my only focus, you know, was to achieve that goal. Um, and just, and just figure that out as I went along. Um, and I'm not sure why so many people don't have that same drive, I guess. I I'd really, everyone's different, you know, yeah, everyone's individual. Uh, I just want to, for me, I think it's about legacy. You know, you can have all the money in the world and, you know, you can die. And, and if you're a bad person, people will say, oh, yeah, I remember that guy he had a bit of money, you know, and he wasn't very nice or, or whatever it is. But if you can get to the end, you know, uh, and plan on hanging around to about 105 years old. But when I get to that age, you know, I'd love to have a packed out church at my funeral and people saying, that guy with three limbs missing did this, that, the other. He didn't make excuses. He was resourceful. He figured it out. He didn't take no for an answer. And he just, he lived the life he wanted to live and he was happy. But like you said earlier, you know, he was also someone who liked to contribute and give back and, and help other people. I was about to say, it comes back to that contribution, doesn't it? Whether you contribute to people in inspiring them to do more things themselves to test themselves more and to challenge themselves understanding that the challenge is what makes them grow so personal growth and contribution like hands down are the most powerful motivators people so yes. some of the clients that i deal with my sort of uh, coaching clients you know high level executives and you know have on the face of it achieved everything that most people in the world are looking for they've got the house they've got the money they've got the family they've got the dog and uh they've got the car real flash car they're just unfulfilled and, and they're trying to work that out and i always say to people look there's lots of i mean i'm not a billionaire i'm doing all right but i'm not a billionaire far from yet it. and yes. uh, well no it's not my goal so if it comes it comes mark right uh but if you're chasing if you're chasing money it's like chasing the wind money's mm -hmm. infinite so you know you will set a goal of like to earn this and i guarantee you once you get there the goal stretched the goal stretch to where you're after something extra. And uh, this, that's the problem with the financial side of it. Money's necessary. We've all got this need to uh, have enough to get by. There's an awful lot of research that I share with people around. There's a limit to this. And, and it's actually not that much where people aren't more fulfilled by having more money. And people go, oh, yeah, it's easy for the millionaires to say, easy for the billionaires to say. Well, that's the only context we've got, right? Listen in. Um, and, but, the, but the people like yourself that you've just said there, the best thing that you do is the sack, get the sack full of letters of thank you and appreciation of gratitude for how you've helped them. And, you know, again, this is something that I try and uh, help people to find, uh, find those missing pieces to their life because once you can find them, um, life becomes a lot more mellow and it becomes a lot more, uh, less stress, you know, um, even though you're stretching yourself and you're outside of your comfort zone to go get it on a whole, it's less stressful because this weight of this, this measure of, or this metric of success is, is different, you know, because, because money is, is never going to be that thing. Uh, relatable. Yeah. When, when I set my goals, you know, I remember my wife saying to me once, cause financial goals are a part of what I set. I'm yep. doing it on Wednesday, actually. I do, I do it every year. And she said to me, you know, why, why do you want to earn this much money? Why do you want to do that? We've got this, we've got that. And I say, it's not about the money. It's, it's about progress and growth because that's what makes human beings happy. They need to see that they're always moving forward, always doing better. It's not, I don't care about the figure. It's yeah. the fact that I don't want to be in the same place next year as I'm in this year. And that's with my health, my fitness, my finances, my family. 
my personal projects, you know, writing books, doing documentary. I don't want to be just sat, you know, having gone, oh, I, I, I've done this before. I want to be saying, what am I doing next? Yeah, absolutely. You mentioned sort of probably halfway through our chat where you just had this quiet moment where you were working out like what was missing in your life. And mm -hmm. again, you probably help people with that now when you talk to them and when they talk to you. But a lot of people are just working in this blinkered, <laughs> rat race of they're not even clear about what they're striving for um, no. and it seems obvious you've already said it before but it seems cliche to say you know getting yourself out of your comfort zone and to sort of stretch yourself is the uh, is the route to success but this is the same it's like people are stuck in this blinkered view of dare i say it keeping up with the joneses um when actually it's not in line with where they're uh, needing to go for their own fulfillment um and working that out takes moments of clarity whether you do that with you know you had a you had a role model in in the sense of a couple of the guys that you work with to kind of have that reflection of well what is it that I'm trying to achieve mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it takes a role model sometimes it takes your own mentor whether you know them or not um, you know you like you said you can YouTube a mentor and you can relate to their circumstances and try and create your own journey and your own story um, and that's for me where people need a little bit of a help sometimes because they uh, the world is just giving you this message of this is what you need to do and it involves buying more things um, yeah. uh, we get I don't think anyone I don't think anyone consciously takes time out of their life to sit and think about it because they are in a rat race like I you know, you know I meditate every morning you know and just for me I have an image in my mind of the what I call the ultimate version of myself you know, and that's what I'm striving for all the time. Better physically, better mentally, you know, better dad, better husband, better employee, better friend. And I sit there and I think about it all the time. What do I want to do? You know, when I, I'm on my deathbed, what legacy do I want to leave? But people don't because they get caught up, like you say, oh, I've got to get the pay rise at work and the job that I hate because I've got to buy the new BMW because the bloke next door has got one and I can't have that. And he's been on holiday twice, so I've got to go on holiday three times. Yeah, exactly. to somewhere you don't even want to go, just getting yourself stressed out, getting them more debt. Absolutely. Completely agree, mate. Um, 10 minutes a day is what I get yeah. people to do. 10 minutes a day of thinking, deliberative thinking about yeah. what they're trying to do the next day and the next week. Yep. Everyone's got 10 minutes. Everyone's too busy, but everyone's got 10 minutes. Um, and the, for me personally, again, I, you know, some people will know this, some people won't. I, I left, I left the military over a year ago now, um, or just about a year ago. And, uh, a lot of people say, oh, how's, how's the transition been? It's been fine. You know, I've really enjoyed it. I feel now I'm thriving because I've got real clear goals and, and people go, oh, goal setting, all that. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. It's all a bit woo. It's like, no, mate, you've always set goals. Every time you've achieved something, you've set goals, whether you realize it or not. Um, and sometimes you just need a bit of a helping hand to, um, to create that image yourself. You've got this image of your ideal self. It's powerful, right? It's really powerful. Yep, 100%. Yeah, 100%. No, absolutely, mate. Um, I'll try and wrap this up in a minute, um, Mark. So now you, you, you know, I've taken up most or a lot of your time and I, I really appreciate it. But just to make you even more relatable to people, you know, what are your weaknesses? We've talked a lot about your strengths. You've got a, a very strong mind, clearly. It's, it's helped you get success throughout your life. Um, but what are you not very good at? Um, no one's listening, mate. You're fine. I've got no I'm one just, listening. I'm, just trying to, I'm, I'm not very good at sometimes balance. Yep. So I'll go, I'll go too hard in one direction with no let up. And, you know, the Invictus Games we talked about was a perfect example. You know, everyone, a lot of people would always say it's not about the meadows. It's about this. It's about that. And I'm like, yeah, right. I'm getting up at five in the morning. I'm doing my first cardio session. Then I'm going to work. Then I'm putting the kids up. Then I'm doing strength and conditioning in the evening. Spend my weekends doing sports specific training. And there's, there's no like, there was no let up. I was like, nope, nothing else matters. This is all it is. You know, I can't eat the ice cream when I'm out with my family because that's not part of my diet plan because then I'll lose and I won't get a gold medal. Sometimes you need to just, I think, take your foot off the gas and enjoy life. You know, I, I really, really, for like the last four or five years, I'm only just getting it now. The last four or five years, I've just been relentless and I haven't had life. I've not sat back and smelt the roses. 
you know, and that's important too, you know, so take that time off and actually enjoy yourself. Yeah. I, uh, I, I buy into that, mate. I, uh, I talk to people about balance. Um, again, I've already mentioned some of the people that I work with and they, their, their lives are out of balance because it's this financial goal that they're pursuing. And you mentioned sort of uh, taking your foot off the gas and enjoying life because that's, that's what we're here for. Right? Um, and I was going to ask you, you know, how do you rein in your enthusiasm? So how do you take your foot off? Because you're clearly someone that's motivated and driven. I work with a lot of people who are incredibly motivated and driven. Um, how do you take your foot off the gas? And what, what are the things that you like to do uh, when you're unwinding? I have to kick my ego into touch and remember that my life isn't all about me. I've got three beautiful kids and a wife at home and they deserve my time and attention too. So you just got to be like, you know, right, that's it. That's enough of you, Mr. Selfish. Now you got to go again in some form of contribution and, and give back and, you know, look, think about the ones around you that have helped you get to where you are. Yeah, massively, mate. That's awesome. Um, two more. So I'm imagining, you know, I, I understand, I don't want to put words in your mouth that any journey has got its ups and downs. And so when things are maybe getting a little bit dark and moody, let's say, in, in, you know, having been in a dark place yourself, you can, I'm sure, recognize when uh, that turns happening. So how do you, how do you manage that? Perspective and gratitude. So I think this is a really good example of perspective. When I was in Headley Court, before I went out to America to train, I was going through a, a down patch, you know, where I was just sore and I was struggling with the legs and I was thinking about giving up. And there's a friend of mine who's, uh, his dad was actually my sixth instructor in training, but Dom, Dominic, when he was out in Norway, he dived in the snow to do a snow angel, but headbutted a rock and broke his spine. So he was, I forget which plegic it was, but he could only really just move his arms and his head like this. And I sat there one day when we were in the galley yeah. and I was really down and I looked at him and I thought, if I was him and I was looking at me and I see this guy there who doesn't have legs, but could get prosthetics and have the opportunity to walk if he just put the effort in. And I'm sat here with legs that will never ever work again that really pissed me off because I'd love to swap places with him. Yeah. And so I looked at it and I thought, well, how can I give up now? And I've got this opportunity to walk, you know, putting things in perspective. It's just going to be hard work. This poor guy will never have the opportunities that I've got, you know, and he's still got a smile on his face. So it was kind of like, you know, putting things in perspective and going, right, sort yourself out, Mark. You know, you got to pick yourself up and crack on. Yeah. And gratitude. You know, you just, I, it was literally this morning before we started talking, I was in the hut with the rest of the team. We're on a work called a Portsmouth. And I was stood up behind them all where they were sat down in the chairs yep. and just stood there thinking, this is brilliant. I'm stood up straight. I've got no legs, but I'm stood up. And I'm five, I'm, I used to be six two. I'm five ten now. You know, I've driven myself up here this morning in my car with no adaptions in it. I independently go to work. I can do what I want. I don't I need anyone with me. And I've got to be grateful for that. I'm grateful for the technology. I'm grateful for every doctor and nurse physio, amputee, everyone that's helped me along the journey to get me where I am. You just got to, if you, if you live in that state when you're grateful for everything, you can't ever get down. Yeah. You can't. There's you know, it's one of the things that I meditate about. There's all, I was about to say, do you do that during your sort of a quiet moments? It, um, there's always something you can be grateful for and feel blessed about, right? There's a, yeah, and again, nice. it feels really, when you're, when you're, Again, I don't think growing up, I really appreciated it. Um, there would have been things that I found that I could have gratitude in, but I didn't sort of, pur I didn't have gratitude with purpose. I didn't go seeking for gratitude purposefully. Does that make sense? Now yep. I will, because I understand, again, I'm, I've got an upcoming pod with a, a neuroscientist and the sort of, it all leads, you know, this gratitude, the release of dopamine, it's all there. If you, yeah. if you challenge yourself to put yourself in that grateful sense and, that positive mental attitude, people go, oh yeah, thanks. It, science supports all this, right? Uh, and and on a bigger scale, you know, you can reflect on your life, and there's always something to be grateful for. Absolutely. Yeah, um, but it, like with, like I said with Dom there about he couldn't walk, why I could? To anyone that's listening to this and they're thinking, well, what can I be grateful for? If you've got two legs, 
go and stand on some hot sand in the beach because I would love, I can remember what it feels like, <laughs> but I'd love to experience it again. And to walk through grass, barefooted, with the blades of grass going in between my toes, I can never do that again. Yeah. And I would love to. So you can be grateful for anything, you know? No, Just little things like that. That's a that's an absolutely valid point, mate. And again, it's context. What's this is what you've got for people a context that many people just can't can't reason with until you speak and until you sort of share your story. Um, mm -hmm. And on that sort of sharing your story, what's your advice on other people pursuing their goals, their dreams, whatever that might be? What's the one piece of advice? One piece of advice. I think the most powerful thing you can do is get around people that have a similar mindset that are on the same kind of mission because one of the most destructive things i ever found in my pursuit of my goals when i was learning to walk was everyone telling me that can't be done no one's ever done that before you can't do that because you've got two legs missing and one arm missing you know and it destroys you and you don't know any better in the early part of my journey but later on when i met other people i knew better and i got around those people and it just propelled my path you know exponentially yeah it's uh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, if you're not surrounded by those people, there is so much opportunity now for people to be surrounded by them. Reach out. You can you can tweet. Yep. Uh, 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 the president of America, if you wanted to. Not that I recommend that you should. But <laughs> you, uh, you could. You got reach into people's lives that you know. Just try, try your luck. You know, I've reached out to people, and it be it's it's amazed me when because what we've spoken about people are just people are seeking for fulfillment um, and contribution themselves if you if people feel like they can help you in some way a lot of people feel better for doing that and so by helping you it helps them right yeah. and so we've got an incredible opportunity with social media etc of just communicating with people that are outside of your network outside of your social circles because we can easily be trapped by people that think so negatively and if you if you can reach it, like have the change of thought about this isn't me, I don't want this, I want more, then you've got to reach out and you've got to take those proactive steps. I talk about action. Um, there's nothing more powerful than taking action and learning more. You learn nothing by doing nothing. You only learn by taking action and, uh, and understanding what the, uh, the outcomes are. Um, yeah. Even if it's bad, you learn more by knowing that it's bad, right? Um, and I'm not condoning people go out and do bad stuff, but uh, more... Well, be, you know, take action in the direction that you see as a positive one and mm -hmm. don't be afraid to fail. Mate, that's, that's awesome. Um, mate, Mark, it's been... Oh, one thing I want to say as well. Um, I watched your documentary. It was probably about this time last year. Were you plugging it pretty hard this time last year? Uh, was it out last time? But no limits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it was this time last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This time yeah. Last year. I, um, I watched it and uh, I convinced, uh, convinced the missus to watch it. And... Uh, and because on the face of it, again, without going into the background, you know, she's not fussed by anything military and I automatically assume this is a story about the military. And I was like, oh, this isn't. And we watched it and uh, it, it genuinely moved me. I thought it was awesome, mate. Um, and I knew parts of your story, um, but I watched it and I was like, that is an incredible story. So anyone listening that hasn't watched it, I absolutely recommend you go watch it out and it's on youtube obviously and is it elsewhere mark no limits. it's on amazon prime it's on youtube and my youtube and it's on my website as well yeah it's an amazing story of overcoming adversity there's not many people um that have got a story quite like it as we've as we've talked about in this and so i'd massively steer people towards that but again just on a personal note mate where can they know more about you, learn more about you, maybe like we've spoke about, reach out to you and maybe use you as a bit of a mentor if that's something that you do. I'm, I'm all over social media, all my Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, all just at Mark Ormrod and you'll be able to find me there easy enough. Yeah, awesome mate. Um, that's mega useful to me and then again, I, I sort of recommend anyone to do just that. Everyone can learn an awful lot from you. So mate, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Um, Thank you for having absolutely me, Absolutely down to earth bloke. After all you've been through, you top draw. Um, and I know you do so much as well for a number of charities. Um, and again, I, I've got so much respect for that. I'd imagine as a lot of people could relate to, you know, think the, the, the challenges that you've been through in your life, it would be so easy to sort of be sort of quite selfish. You've, got, you've earned the right to be quite selfish. Right. You've also learned that that isn't the route to sort of uh, 
uh, happiness and fulfillment going forward. So I've got a lot of respect for the amount of work you do for um, other organizations, not just looking out for number one, far from it. And you, you are you. an inspiration to people, mate. So thanks very much for talking to us and hopefully our paths cross again soon, mate. I hope so, mate. I hope so. Yeah. Nice one. All right. Cheers, Mark.